Good evening, everybody. How's the Alec family doing out there? I heard this side. I know there's a dividing line between the two, but how's this side of the Alec family doing? Excellent. Well, we'll get started on this panel on education. I, I will tell you that they're, my best friend in Congress is an obscure congressman named Trey Gowdy from South Carolina. And, and Trey says that education is the closest thing to magic in America. Quality education is. Tell me how both of you got involved in the education movement, and what have you seen that works in your states, and what would you like the federal government to do less of? Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate all your great work, and it's an incredible honor to be here, and I want to thank the Center for Education Reform for giving us this opportunity and for being a strong partner with the American Legislative Exchange Council. For me, it's a very simple story, and Jeannie and I go way back. I, Billy asked one very fateful question in my daughter's four-year-old kindergarten classroom. She's 28 years old, so you can do the, the math. And the question was, can you show me the research to support this reading program that's not working for my daughter and, quite frankly, the entire class? I thought it was a rather simple question. I'm a mom, I'm a nurse, concerned about my daughter. And for asking that question, I was sent to the principal's office for daring to ask that question. <laughs> From there, I was sent to the superintendent's office, and the next thing I knew, I was going to school board meetings and writing letters to the editor. And that's really what started my pursuit of understanding education, wanting greater options and choices for parents. It just so happened that that was the time that the landmark school choice program was beginning in the city of Milwaukee, which is my hometown. So I, it's, it's very easy to see how I got pulled into the movement and have been very proud to have been a part of it as an activist mom, but then also to have this lead me to run for elected office. And um, that's really how it started for me. Awesome. Representative? Uh, in the early 90s, uh, I'm working in the Indiana Department of Commerce, uh, selling Indiana as a, as a business location, not only for expansions, but for uh, new businesses. And oddly enough, my interest in this came through Japanese transplants. We were, uh, at the time, getting a lot of Japanese companies coming over here, uh, building uh, primarily auto-related uh, parts plants in and around uh, Indiana. And they were deeply concerned about the lack of education that many of their employees were coming to them with. And uh, so it became uh, something of concern that time, there was the Nation at Risk was uh, came out. Uh, Goals 2000 uh, started in uh, by George uh, 41, uh, and so all this was, there was big attention. I, I, I worked for, for a few years doing that. I eventually found myself in uh, Governor John Ingler's office in Michigan. He hired me as his education policy advisor, and I'll tell you in, a, in his interview, he, he, I don't come with any academic background. I'm not. Uh, my family used to be in the asphalt business, so I don't have any. Uh, credentials. Um, he asked me what I thought of public schools, and I said, I think they suck. And, he said, <laughs> and, he, and it was basically, you're hired. Uh, <laughs> if you know, <laughs> if you know uh, John Engler, he was uh, iconoclast in the sense of uh, trying to go after things, and he, he bred into me uh, 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 just a, a rabid uh, dislike for the status quo and anything that would free kids up uh, to be uh, better, prepared, better prepared for uh, the world what we were going to do. So uh, we've done an awful lot in Michigan and we'll continue to do so. Awesome. Thank you both. Let's talk for a few minutes about what plagues public education and what we can do to fix it. I thought it was interesting that, Tim, you've, you're talking about workforce readiness. And when we think about what's coming our way by the year 2020, We'll have three million opens, openings for skilled laborers, five million in the STEM world. So it appears to me that part of what plagues us, we haven't figured out the answer to, especially when we have 5.8 million vacancies in America today. You talked about what I think is the equilibrium, programs that are effective for students that have measurable progress in reasonable time and asking an audacious question like, what is it? And it doesn't work. Took you on a long, long journey. 
What plagues us, and how do we fix it? Complacency. Complacency. I, I think largely. I, I think that, uh, you know, we need to uh, do the thing. We're so worried about process. So much of, uh, so much of the education community is, is built on process and not outcomes. Uh, it's inputs, not results. Uh, you know, how many, it's, it's about class size, it's about dollars, it's about, you know, and we've done things to address all these things. I can tell you in Michigan, uh, funding is, is going like this while performance is going like this. We're, we're, we're putting more money into education, we've got less students than we've ever had. And yet we're bringing up the rear uh, on, in education nationally on a lot of different things. So what, you know, what is this? And, it, and it's, uh, we've been saying for a long time, uh, you know, you used to be able to come right out of high school and, and if you were uh, beefy and brawny enough, you had a job in the auto plant. Well, now those jobs, it, doesn't, it's, it takes brain to not brawn anymore and you have to be able to compute. You have to be able to communicate with one another. You have to be able to read well. And I think that largely uh, we're, we're, we've, we're raising a nation of illiterates. Uh, look in any large city, uh, and it's absolutely dismal. I, you know, we uh, have Detroit uh, in, in my state of Michigan. Ninth, ninth uh, 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 proficiency, 9% proficiency. 9% of, in reading and math. I mean, why they shouldn't even be open to be able to do that. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an aberration. Uh, they should, their license should be pulled. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's absolutely, uh, it's, it's horrible. Well, we have terrible. a similar situation with the city of Milwaukee with terrible uh, um, score, test scores as well. And I, I call it educational malpractice. And it's just a shame that the teachers union and the educational bureaucracy has allowed the status quo to continue. And they so fear competition, and that's truly what we need is competition. You know, one of the, the most revealing things that happened when our Milwaukee Parental Choice Program got off the ground um, that was very shocking. One day I opened up our local newspaper and saw a full page ad for one of the public high schools in the Milwaukee public school system. The first time I ever saw an ad. So our Milwaukee Parental Choice Program caused the Milwaukee Public Schools to suddenly realize we are in the business of competition and now we have to attract parents as well. And it has made a difference. It continues to we're beset with problems because people don't like to see the continuation of the program and they're trying to regulate it and over-regulate it to, as a way of killing it. But competition is the key, and we all know that. And that's one of the great principles that we at a in ALEC support and, and put forward. So um, we've got a long way to go, but it, competition is the key. Let's talk about that a little bit more because as we think about what plagues our schools around the country, the reality of it is what I heard from both of y'all is that the more money you spend does not necessarily correlate with better outcomes. I know in South Carolina, in Fairfield County, one of the counties in South Carolina, we can spend about 17000 per student and get worse results than we do in Greenville County where you're spending around $9,700 per student. So when we're thinking about solutions and the way forward, if you were to look in your states and in your heart where you have passion. What's the, what's the solution that you're talking about the most, Chairwoman and, and Representative, share with us where we're heading in, in Michigan? Well, I think the solution, first of all, we've had, uh, we were one of the first to have a charter school law uh, back in 1994. We've currently got uh, about 10,000 students or 100,000, uh, 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 they, they've now consumed about a billion dollars worth of our funds. We're a $14 billion K-12 education budget in Michigan. Uh, charters get about a billion dollars of that now. So it's serious business. And it's, and it's uh, attention that the, the ed community certainly takes notice of and is trying to do everything they can. Luckily, we have a majority, Republican majority in the House and Senate, Republican governor, so we stave off any kinds of uh, nonsense about trying to control uh, charter schools. 
but uh, it's about uh, freedom. I, you know, we're, we've got uh, the most prohibitive Blaine language in the country, as prohibits uh, public dollars going for, for private use. However, we've done some things over the years that kind of blur those lines. I'm happy to say uh, in this last budget night, and I uh, chair K-12 education probes in Michigan, in the House, and for the first time in history, we put a $2.5 million appropriation in for non-public schools. Now, this money is not for instruction. It's to basically pay for what uh, we would consider mandated costs, uh, fire drills, attendance, things that, they, quite frankly, they would do without this. But it's, uh, it's a way of opening up the discussion uh, because I think that we need to take this further. I think money needs to be, you know, we already basically have a public school voucher now. They can take their money uh, to a, a local public school, a local uh, public charter school. We, knew ex we need to expand that to private parochial schools. Excellent. Well, you're absolutely right, yeah. Senator, when you say that more money doesn't mean better education, because what we have seen in our program in the state of Wisconsin is that with fewer dollars, our children in our private school choice program are having better outcomes uh, than their counterparts in the public schools. And, and so the key for us in Wisconsin is that we have continued to expand on our original program that started in the city of Milwaukee. We went to another community in Racine, and just this past session we went to a statewide program. Um, again, we're incrementally increasing the number of children that can be a part of the program, but you know, if I were to, you know, wave my wedge, magic wand, I would just say, let's open the floodgates wide open, let the money follow the children, and let parents make the choices for their children. And I, I mean, we all know the hashtag, I trust parents. I trust parents. I, as a pediatric nurse practitioner my entire career, I worked in the inner city of Milwaukee. And I, I know that parents want the best for their kids. And I trust them to make those decisions. And I think that, unfortunately, too many in the education establishment make excuses for our children, especially our disadvantaged children, and think that they're not capable of getting out of the, the desperate situation that they're in. And they don't give them the opportunity to rise to that level. And, um, I, I think that it's doing our children a disservice. You only have one shot at your K through 12 education, and we've got to make it as, as good as possible. And so beyond the public school choice um, we've done, I mean, the private school choice program, we have expanded our charter schools in Wisconsin. Um, more authorities are allowed to create charter schools. And then just this past session, I'm incredibly proud of the fact that we passed a special needs voucher program in the state of Wisconsin, which is something that's very near and dear to my heart as I watched the McKay Scholarship Program in Florida. And I wanted desperately to give families of children with special needs the same opportunity. We'll spend a little more time in a, in a minute on special needs, but let's continue. Senator, Tim? I just want to follow yes, up with that, and I, I think that's, I introduced uh, a bill to, again to amend our Constitution but because of our Blaine language to allow, I thought it would be a good way, at least a, 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 to start the discussion would be through special needs. So I wanted to follow up on, on the McKay scholarship. And, and I would, happy to say, it's out of the Education Committee, I don't know if Amanda Price is here, uh, chair of our Education Policy Committee in Michigan. Anyway, I sit on that committee as well, but she took, uh, took up a hearing and we passed it out of committee. I don't think it's gonna uh, do well on the floor. You gotta have two thirds uh, majority to, to amend the Constitution. But anyway, uh, we're trying to do what we can. We've just got this uh, damnable language in our uh, state Constitution yeah. that we need to deal with. We certainly on a federal level, I've sponsored legislation called the Choice Act that includes uh, making the $11 billion or so, the IDEA money for special needs kids, portable. Yeah. All, yeah. All, you know, making, giving the states the op opportunity to do so if they decide to do so. On a funding uh, perspective or funding conversation around charter schools, I know that in South Carolina, charter schools receive less money than your average public school, uh, but they oftentimes have pretty strong, re very strong results. Same would be true with any type of a voucher program significantly fewer, fewer dollars. And perhaps the best example I have of the success of, of choice is the DC Opportunity Scholarship, where the average student in DC costs about $20,000 per student, with a graduation rate around 54%. And the Opportunity Scholarship 
costs around $8,500, with a graduation rate around 93%. So for less than half the money, you get twice the results, and yet it's being challenged all over the place. Are your fund, do you see the same type of disparity in funding in both your states? Absolutely, and but even though there's that disparity, we're seeing the greater success rate in yeah. those kids. And I think that's one of the things that we need to do more is to tout, tout those results. And you know, we oftentimes hear, you know, you're taking money away from public schools and making it difficult. Well, we're, we're taking money away, but you know, you, we're giving it them less money, and they seem to be doing better with it. So, it's it's very very frustrating that um, you know we hit against that wall, and in, instead of touting and allowing the success of these children to be realized, we've got the naysayers who are saying you're just destroying public education, and I. And I, I, not every child is going to make it in a public school. Every child is different. We have to look at the fact that maybe a, a brick and mortar school isn't gonna work for one child and a virtual charter school will work for that child. So again, you know, Howard Fuller, who is a champion of school choice from the city of Milwaukee, often used this phrase, and, and it's so right. He said, we have to stop thinking about educating children in school systems, but instead think about educating children in a system of schools, mm -hmm. because there are every child has a different need, and maybe that need is met in a public, a private, a virtual, or in um, and a homeschool. Let's not forget homeschooling as well. Yeah. We, uh, we, you know, clearly have a lot of the same arguments going on. It's 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 interesting how, uh, for where we come in from funding, we uh, a thing called uh, in 1994 we did Proposal A, which kind of swapped local school funding for state funding, and uh, where we would came up with a foundation allowance, and that's piggybacked on every kid. Now, to the higher spending districts, it was kind of an uh, amalgam. If you were a higher spending district, you were kind of held harmless. You get a little bit of that, and we make up for it. But so in the last, you know, the last 20 years, we try and you know, make up the difference. So we bring the bottom up. And we call it a 2x formula. Every time we have some extra money to throw into education, which we have for the last six years in a row, uh, you'll never hear that from the Democrats, by the way. But nonetheless, uh, that uh, we're, we're, the charter schools are getting the max amount every time, like this year it was 60, 160 and 120, 60 the top, 120 the bottom. Uh, because charter schools don't get local millage money, they don't get you know, the pro local property tax money, they're already at somewhat of a disadvantage. So we're making that up uh, as, we, as we fund the foundation allowance. Have, have either one of you uh, been a part of anything that you would consider cutting edge and innovative in the space of education? that we could share with the audience that they might want to replicate in their states? Well, I just mentioned, again, we're trying to push the envelope annually. Uh, as, as long as I've been uh, in, a, in a position to where I can in Michigan, I'm keep, you know, last year tried to do the public school, non-public school funding. It was stripped out by my own party, uh, by my own caucus. I told them, I'm, you can do it. I'm gonna keep coming back till we get this. Uh, this year, uh, the, you know, the Catholic Conference and non-public schools did their work, their homework, uh, got the Senate involved, got the governor on board. So when I introduced it, uh, at a million dollars, the Senate ant, ant, up the ante at five million dollars. We conferenced at two and a half. It was never about the amount of money. It was the line item. It was the, it was the intent. Uh, now that we have a line item, by the way, we'll, the governor just recently asked for a Supreme Court opinion before the budget kicks in and. And we're going to have that little battle because the uh, education community, including the ACLU, are fighting tooth and nail against uh, what they see as a further uh, abrogation of, of, of their money, their dollars going to uh, uh, public or, or, or uh, Catholic or private use. Well, beyond expanding public, uh, private school choice, charter schools, and special needs, we did a little thing in Wisconsin under the leadership of Scott Walk Walker, and that was called collective bargaining reform. Maybe you all remember that. <laughs> And, and, I, and I would say that, you know, you think collective bargaining reform, what does that have to do with schools? But it was a huge, <laughs> a lot. well, many people did say that to us. It was a huge 
burden that was taken off of our local school districts to be able to now suddenly decide how best to use their education dollars. And you know, when you talk about what are the things that we can do as legislators, both at the federal and the state level, let the local school districts decide how they want to spend their money, how best to spend that money, and again, always give parents choices and options. So to me, that is something that's very, um, very cutting edge. And if you haven't done it in your state, call us. We'll tell you how to do it. Senator, let me make a note real quick here. Dear federal government, please get the heck out of the exactly. way. Exactly. <laughs> Did I, did I hear that right? That was my message to you, Senator. Yes, yes. <laughs> Love all of us. <laughs> Got it. Okay, I'm sorry. I wanted to make sure I took that note down before we went on. Because we are slow in Washington. <laughs> Everybody says amen? Amen. I agree with y'all. <laughs> Representative, you were getting ready to say something. I was just going to say, Tim, you were asking before, uh, you know, some of the line of question you might, you know, it's what can Washington do or not yes, do? And I think that the... Uh, uh, while ESSA may be a start uh, of, of devolving uh, control back to the state, certainly. I think if, you know, we're, we're looking for block grant funds, if you can't block grant, certainly unbundle. Uh, we need to be able to piggyback Title I and Title funds onto kids as we see it, not as the districts. Yes. Uh, one of the things, as Leah was talking, when I uh, remember my first uh, t uh, time I hit the gavel as chair in the K-12 approach in, in Michigan was, uh, I said, this, we're going to be about funding kids, not districts. Uh, and we're not going to be funding uh, inputs, we're going to fund results. And this is uh, uh, something that I think that uh, we need to continue with, but we need to have every bit of freedom to tack on, piggyback those federal funds. Uh, I think that you, you know, kids all ought to start out with the kind of the same amount of funding and you kind of add, add back to whatever kinds of things, whether it's, a, it's a, a special needs or poverty or, or different kinds of things to be able to add back, add that too. But let us control how that's done, uh, not Washington. Hearty amen. It's amazing that Washington provides somewhere between 15 and 17 percent of the revenue or funds for schools, but we want to have about 90 percent of the control. Yeah. It's pretty ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, Please tell your representatives I said that, please. Congress members and senators, very ridiculous. Two, two, two more questions. I think we're getting ready to get towards the end of the panel discussion, five minutes left. Number one, sometimes we have to go back to the future. Great movie, but ed, from an education perspective, when I was in high school, way before you two, there was something called shop, vocational education, dual track. Today, a high school student who does not graduate er earns around $19,000 a year when that child becomes about a 25-year-old. So you spend four years in school, three years in school, or two years in school, or a year in school. You don't finish high school, your annual income at 25 is $19,000 a year. We're going to have three million vacancies in skilled labor. I think there's dignity in all work. Dignity in all work. I do not believe that a skilled job is a lesser track, a less valuable option for anyone, whether you finish high school or not. You can go to, in parts of Texas, I hear, you can earn $125,000 a year as a welder. Uh, part of the focus, I think, if we're going to help all of our kids reach their full potential, has to have a component around shop, vocational education, or something like that. Oh, you're absolutely right. Wisconsin has been a leader in that, and I've been very proud to work on several programs related to that because we have a huge manufacturing base in Wisconsin, and, and uh, many of our manufacturers are saying, we, you know, our people are getting close to retirement, and we need to find a way to bridge that skills gap. And so definitely there's some innovative things that can be done in that regard. And, and I think one of the other things, you know, oftentimes, and I, and I understand the pressure that parents put on kids, and I understand the pressure that guidance counselors in high schools have to be able to say, you know, 75% of our kids went to an Ivy League school. We're doing our children a huge disservice by making them think that they should all go to four-year colleges and, and, and just to, 
push them away from opportunities and apprenticeships and very good skilled labor jobs. So the more that um, we can expose our students to that, and sometimes it just means as community members, we have to put a little bit more pressure on our school districts. Um, as community, as business leaders go into the schools, say, I have this great opportunity for jobs. Let, our, let these children see what can be done. But there are certainly legislatively, uh, legislative options that can be done to bring um, a partnership between your skilled labor groups in your state and, and the education and get these kids on a track where they will succeed instead of setting them up for failure by sending them to a four-year school that they're not going to able, be able to get through. Last question, and let me just say before I ask this question, thank you so much, Senator, I want to get it right, Vukmir. I was going to call her Senator Leah to make it easy on myself. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Vukmir <laughs> and Representative Kelly for your participation in this panel, lively conversation, truly appreciate it. How do we as conservatives win the marketing opportunity that is before us on the issue of school choice? Every parent that gets involved seems to enjoy it. 94% <laughs> approval rating in DC. When you look at the numbers of uh, uh, percentages of parents who are involved in the uh, school choice movement, high 80s, low 90s consistently. We're still having to fight uphill to continue this battle and win it. What's our, if you have one marketing idea? Just one, one marketing idea, what would it be? Put a face on the program. Make a story. <laughs> we oftentimes, as conservatives, talk a lot about facts and figures, and we don't tell stories. And I think that one of the most powerful things that happened in Wisconsin when we um, moved to lift the cap on our Milwaukee Parental Choice Program was to bring the children to the Capitol, and they told the story and to have the parents of these children tell the story of what they were trying to uh, flee from and how the schools were, were failing their kids. We all want our kids to succeed and to see those parents with tears in their eyes asking us to give their kids a choice. That's how you win over the hearts and minds of people and ultimately we did that in Wisconsin. Tell awesome. a story, put a face on it. That's great. I, I, I would agree. I would also go, as, you know, say that I think that we need to get into African American churches, and it has to come from the pulpit. And they, you have to have to break this bond. I would call it bondage between the uh, between the Democrat Party and, and and many in the African uh, American community. You really have to break because it's it's the teachers unions, the Democrats. The, that's it's this cabal that I can I can guarantee you know there's a lot of kids in bad schools but if you're black I can guarantee you you're likely in a bad school uh, and it's just it's it's unnecessary I think it's unconscionable and it's something that that's the way I think that we have to attack it I think and it's about providing that choice once people see it look what's happened in DC look what's happened in Milwaukee look I mean it's 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 you provide an avenue they will bolt <laughs>